tonight's been an interesting night, and there's a lot of stuff that happened behind the scenes that you guys didn't see. So if we seem a little bit ruffled, um, just go with it. Go with it. It's show business, right? Uh, so let's see where are we at. Um, I should mention that tonight is the first time that we're actually going to be filmed, um, thanks to Shane. Um, so I'm actually filming it for my mom. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> And then you hear my voice on the Swedish accent come on. It's my mom. Uh, so, but if you're not comfortable with the filming, if you don't want to be on camera or anything like that, uh, wear sunglasses, hide your face. I don't know what else to tell you. Leave. But yeah, there are cameras in the space tonight. I just want y'all to be aware of that. Um, okay, so we're gonna get started with the intro. We do an intro every nerd night. I try to make it interesting because you hear the same thing. Um, so basically, Nerd Night is global, anywhere you go in the world, well, within reason, um, about 80 cities around the world, you're going to find a Nerd Night, um, which is pretty cool. It's a lot of drunk people giving presentations. You really can't beat that if you're a tourist. You should seek out the Nerd Night. Um, um, so then this is my job as the boss to tell you that Chris Bellacrashon started Nerd Night in 2003. He started it in um, in Boston, actually. Um, and what happened was, he's like this guy who studies birds. Um, and no one really, they pretty much got tired of him talking about his job in the bar. And they were like, okay, Chris, what if you just put together this awesome slideshow, sh showed us what you did in your job, and kind of did it once, so it's done and over with. Um, but it turned out that it was so popular that it's happened a bit more than once. Surprise, surprise. Um, then, Matt Wazowski, real name, he was tasked with expanding Nerd Night globally, and he did that in a pretty amazing way. So Nerd Night Global pretty much runs off of local nerds like all of us. We don't really have any marketing person or advertising person. It's whomever is in the city locally, we help just recruit nerds. That's what we do. Um, so let me see. We have global festivals in which city bosses nominate and vote for, for the local nerds to present. Uh, and the festival this year is once again um, in partnership with the Smithsonian Ma Magazine and will again for the third time in a row be at the Smithsonian Museum. So if you happen to be over near the museum this summer. Go ahead and check that out. I believe it's in June. Yes. If you're here tonight, uh, you're actually in really good company, if that's how you want to look at it. Uh, Nerd Night attracts people like astronauts, scientists, actors, and professional beer growers, to name just a few. You are now a Nerd Nighter. Congratulations. <laughs> I love it. That's the enthusiasm we're going for. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's a great, that, that's me. Uh, that was me when I was presenting in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Phnom Penh is the capital of Cambodia. Every local Nerd Night boss is also been a presenter. It's one of the rules. Uh, my real name, the name that my mama gave me, is Darla Hain. I also go by a second name. There's reasons for that. And I'm the founder of Nerd Night Anchorage. Yay! Thank you. Say that. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the applause. Um, okay, so as boss, there are some uh, traditions because rules are made to be broken, but traditions last forever. So there are some global traditions that we practice at Nerd Night. And first, I have to say that every Nerd Night is uncensored. JT, where you at? Uncensored, okay? Um, if you brought your six-year-old here to learn about dinosaurs, ee. Um, JT has promised boobs, that's all. Uh, which is a great deviation from the penis that we normally get at Nerd Night. So, boobs for JT, yeah. All right, Nerd Night is controversial and political present presentations are okay, but Nerd Night and Anchorage asks that presenters don't mention by name any clubs, Schools, universities, businesses, or products, and name religious groups or political parties only as it pertains to their presentation. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from the nerds. 
and not be told about an organization, be sold a business idea, or convert to a religion. Or be told about both. Nerd Night has no control over how offended or challenged you are by the content being presented. Don't be pissed off. Just please don't. Um, allow each presenter to be the speaker and to have the stage, and please do offer loud and enthusiastic encouragement. That's awesome. Each presentation is roughly 15 to 20 minutes um, and is followed by a question and answer. Question is, and answer is your time and that's when you get to, you know, ask the presenter questions that pertain to the presentation. We all know how this works. All right. After every presentation, there's beer and bathroom. This is important. Uh, it's usually about five minutes long. Even if you're still in the beer line when we start up again, don't worry about it, stay in the beer line. Uh, and feel free to go back to the beer line if you want to. That's cool, that's okay. <laughs> oh, key, if you see the snow goose staff and they're wandering around with these really heavy trays of food and you order food, please hold up your number so that they can find you. That just helps put them out of their misery. It's all cool for everyone. And you get your food while it's hot. That's awesome. Okay, I'll leave this up here for a bit, and if you want to take down the information, maybe put it in your, your phone, take a photo of it, uh, whatever you need to do. We are looking for presenters. Um, you really don't have to have a college degree, and you really don't have to be an astronaut. If you are, that's cool. Uh, but if you're passionate about anything, and you want your community to know about it, Nerd Nights for you. And just get a hold of us. Um, we'll give you a microphone. It's pretty cool. So, everyone have the info? Yep. Food changes. Ooh. There were food changes, yeah. Everybody's just going to explain. <laughs> Hiya. Okay, really quickly, just to let you guys know, summer's coming very soon, which means summer tourists which means they're going to mob this whole deck, which means most likely we will not be having food service for the summertime only. So that means you might want to come a little early if you can, like when you get off work, just come in your work clothes like me and just get some food early, but we probably won't have anyone running food in for the summer only. You can talk to Chris and you'll know about it later, but that will be potentially coming. Also think about that with parking. So the next three months, we're still gonna have nerd night, but think about parking, think about the deck, bring some friends, and then come to Nerd So, just to warn you. They want anyone to cry. <laughs> the fish and chips are very tasty. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, uh, if you have all this information, you're all good. It brings us to our next slide, because now is when I'm gonna tell you to put the phones away. Um, unless you're taking pictures. If you're taking pictures, that's cool. And I tried to think of like this, this very um, powerful and forceful person, and I picked Madeline Albright to help convey the message that this is a strong tradition at Nerd Night. So, you know, please stay unplugged. That would be awesome. Um, we don't really have exceptions here at Nerd Night Anchorage, except for people like Steve Tyler, Madeline Albright, and Anderson Cooper. So those guys can come in and to Nerd Night Anchorage and do pretty much whatever they want. <laughs> okay. So tonight, we have beer, and B-movies, and the current unpleasantness, um, which again, we've been promised bosoms. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I think tonight we're just gonna roll with it, see what happens, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, and I am going to introduce our first speaker, if I can find his speaker notes here, the ones that I really handily took out so I would know where they were. Um, Andrew, I'm looking for your speaker notes. They're not that important. Yeah, he has an excellent, a really cool summary. Um, aha! Okay, so, Andrew Schmidt. Um, Andrew was born and raised in Kodiak, Alaska. He attended college in Anchorage and has lived here for several years, save for a few stints in Fairbanks. Andrew began brewing at 19 and has been enamored of the mythical substance ever since. He is a brewer at a local brewery, which shall remain nameless, and a longtime information dispensing device at another popular alcohol locale. 
Things that he's super passionate about, besides beer, include natural beauty, extreme music, social justice, and subversion of popular culture and the status quo. So, local nerds, ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Schmidt. All right, my name is Andrew Schmidt, and beer is the reason that civilization exists. Um, so before we unpack that statement a little bit, I'm going to go over some ground rules, what this, this talk is and what it is not. So, for the purposes of beer, beer is, I'm using the definition of a wonderful man named Max Nelson, who wrote a book called The Barbarian Beverage, that just kind of talks about, like, uh, sort of Roman and pre-Roman, because Romans hated, hated, hated beer. Um, and the whole sort of like Gaulish, Belgium, Low Countries, Britain sort of fascination with beer and how they were awful people. So his definition of beer is any sort of maltose-based alcoholic beverage, whether or not the ingredients include other products, fermented or not, and a fermented drink made essentially from malted cereal, water, and yeast. So, I mean, ancient beer had honey, grapes, whatever. So, but primarily malted cereal, unmalted cereal, turns it into sugar, ferments it, you got beer. Um, hops were a much later invention, does not necessarily mean that it is or is not a beer. Uh, the other sort of kind of unfortunate thing about this talk is that it's gonna be really, really, really Euro and kind of Middle Eastern centric. Like, unfortunately, I mean, it, what's, what's fascinating is that the earliest evidence, some of the earliest evidence of beer, again, that definition of beer, um, was found in China around 7,000 years ago. But, I'm probably not going to talk about anything further east than, I don't know, Iraq, Iran, the Fertile Crescent. It's going to be basically the Fertile Crescent and then Europe. So, uh, which is unfortunate because many, many regions have fascinating, fascinating indigenous uh, sort of regional fermented beverages. In fact, I think it's more interesting what places do not have uh, indigenous fermented beverages. Um, Interestingly, Alaska is one of them. Not any indigenous fermented beverages up here that, that have ethanol, as we traditionally understand. Um, so mostly I'm gonna to try to highlight the, uh, the kind of economic impact that beer has had on European civilization and then American civilization. Uh, we probably won't get to European America this talk. Um, and so that's the other thing, is that originally I intended this to be from like Neolithic era up to the modern day, and that's just not. Um, so catch me again at another Nerd Night sometime soon when we'll finish it up in however many parts we need. Um, but basically what we're going to cover today is about from Neolithic era, like early traditions of beer, up to around 12, 1300 AD, which is the introductions of hops. So this is going to be a pretty hopless talk as far as things are concerned. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. Um, Mesopotamia around, ooh, first, we'll unpack my statement, beer is the reason civilization exists. So think about this. Um, as you have a civilization that is starting to make these grand sort of um, advancements in agriculture, they're able to get more grain, they're able to store the grain, they're able to do this, that, the other thing with the grain. Well, at the end of the day, if you try and make bread out of all of this grain, it's gonna rot. You try and make, uh, you just try and pack this grain away into a silo, and it's gonna rot and mold. But if you malt it, ferment it into beer, now you have a shelf-stable food source that is also purified water. So, ergo, your civilization can flourish, uh, flourish and prosper. And that's basically my whole argument for why beer is the reason that Indo-European civilization exists. Um, Mesopotamia, 6000 BC, that was the first time that a stone tablet, that, that is the oldest dated stone tablet that has a beer recipe on it. Um, there was a, a city in 3500 BC called Uruk, in Sumeria, uh, I like to pronounce it with that little bit of an accent, not to confuse it with the Uruk Hai, Lord of the um, And this is one of the first cities in which grain production drastically increased. Um, and at that point, they were trading their grains and their beer for much more scarce material. I mean, timber, precious stems, jewels, the like. Um, during the second millennium BC, Babylonians were already issuing laws to protect and preserve beer brewing methods because, um, I mean, if people are super secretive and will make employees sign non-disclosure agreements for brewing technology now, imagine when they were first discovering like, holy crap, I can soak this grain in water and all of a sudden it becomes sugary and I can ferment it? I don't even know what fermentation is. I don't even understand that yeast is a living organism. It just happens. 
Um, so yeah, they're passing these laws all the time. 3000 BC, we've got beer production spreading over to Egypt. Um, it's said that Ramses III found beer to be so noble that he and all of his guests drank it from golden cups. Um, and this is an anecdote that I learned when I was taking, um, actually, was it, my, it was some class in college. Um, but that beer was really what paid for the pyramids. I mean, um, all of these slaves, impoverished and oppressed as they were, still needed to be relatively healthy in order to produce these giant freaking structures. So their beer was kind of this real muddy stuff that never gone through the settlement phase. Like, even this, this was pulled straight out of a barrel, not even using CO2 pressure. This was pulled out using pump technology only. And it's still really clear. Like, the beer that these guys were drinking had no filtration whatsoever. And they would actually drink it um, in a big clay jugs with a straw so that they could avoid the yeast that was probably still fermenting on the top and all the sediment down in the bottom because well, ancient peoples might have known a lot of things, but they didn't know about sediment and filtration. <laughs> um, so, 3000 BC is about the earliest evidence that, that anybody's seen of beer production in Europe. Um, I'm not entirely sure if it's one of those real traditional brewing places like Austria, Germany, or the Low Countries, or anything like that. Um, but that's just like kind of generally the earliest sort of evidence they've seen um, of beer production. The Greeks actually kind of enjoyed beer. Um, 500 BC, the Greeks were still uh, brewing beer, but as grape production kind of spread and wine became more common and easily produced, um, it really kind of went out of favor and the Romans spread everywhere and they were really decent. So. Um, but Sophocles, one of, one of the better of the, the Greek philosophers, did believe that beer was really healthy and that it was part of a diet of moderation which included bread, meat, uh, vegetables in addition to the beer. Um, and again, so the Romans did learn some brewing techniques from the Egyptians, um, but uh, my, my fantastic Economics of Beer, I encourage everybody to read it, um, says this, that Romans particularly despised beer brewers and their drinkers, um, and regarded them as barbarians and uncivilized, and so when we think about places that are uh, like Romance languages, places that the Romans really, really left their mark, France, Spain, the area in between, um, Romanian is actually a Romance language. I don't know if anybody necessarily knew that, but it totally is. Um, but these kind of areas that are now very, very well regarded as wine-growing regions, until the Romans freaking swept through and did their thing, they were beer-brewing nations, like everybody grew barley and turned it into beer. Um, and so this is actually just kind of interesting poetically, um, a statement from Emperor Julian. And he says about beer, regarding it, comparing it to wine, who and where are you, Dionysius? Since by the true Bacchus I do not recognize you, I know only the son of Zeus. While he smells like nectar, you smell like a billy goat. Can it be that the Celts, because of lack of grapes, made you from cereals? Therefore one should call you Demetrius, not Dionysius. Rather wheat-born and bromus, not bromius. Uh, wheat-born rather than fire-born, and bromus is, is apparently the Roman word for oats and bromius is a Latin word for roar of thunder. So I have no idea what that means, but it sounds kind of cool. Um, so despite all of this, even during Roman rule, you still saw places like Britain and Belgium and, and Germania, which because, I don't know, if, also, I don't know if anybody knew, uh, Germany wasn't a country, country called Germany until like the mid 1800s. Up until that point, it was the Holy Roman Empire, a bunch of sort of amalgamated city-states where one king's rule only extended as the borders of his freaking city. Um, so that's going to be a very, very important sort of concept to keep in mind as we progress forward through things, where we talk about, uh, like, in fact, so the Rheinheitsgebot. Everybody knows about the Rheinheitsgebot, right? The Germany Purity Law, 1516, says that beer can only be made with water, malts, hops, and yeast. So that's a Bavarian law. And the Kingdom of Bavaria, while sizable, did not encompass all of Germany. Um, like there's six or seven other regions of Germany and all of those were like several other countries uh, up until you know the 1850s. Um, so in the fifth century AD is I'm pretty sure when like the Goths swept out of Eastern Europe and kind of sacked Rome and Rome's influence really declined and we had the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and by that point, um, the Germanics had taken control of large swaths of Western Europe, which heralded another great beer revival. Um, now we're moving into some very, very interesting sort of beer traditions where monasteries became the centers of brewing. 
Um, and up until probably, ooh, I don't know, the 12th or the 13th centuries. Uh, so the 13 and 1400s, I guess. No, other way around. Um, anyway, there were basically no commercial breweries. The people that produced the most beer was solely monasteries. And so this kind of coincided with Charlemagne around 800 AD, um, which is when the first time hops started being used. And we'll come back to that later. But Charlemagne's power um, kind of spread. He really believed in setting up monasteries all over the place. Um, this is also the reason that books and all this knowledge still happened. Um, so the guys in the monasteries, those monks, they found it, especially in these northern countries, they found it much easier to grow barley than to grapes. So these places in the south, France, Italy, Spain, all these wine growing regions, they still kept growing grapes, but the guys in the north thought it was easier to grow grain. Um, especially uh, a huge burst in, in brewing happened in the low countries, which is modern day Luxembourg, um, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Um, Northern Belgium. Southern Belgium was Wallonia, and that's a whole other thing entirely. Um, St. Gall in 820 was a, Belg uh, a Belgian monastery where they discovered that this place had three breweries, and they would have a brewery for the monastery guests because according to a particular order of Catholicism that we really, really don't need to get into, um, they had to provide hospitality. So they'd have a brewery for the guests. That provided the best beer. Then they'd have two separate breweries for peasants and pilgrims and for the monks. And I'm not entirely sure why that was because as far as um, I know they were doing that, they were making about the same quality of beer. Um, so, all of this is going on. They're just making beer. And has anybody ever heard of Groot beer? Groot beer. Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Groot beer? So, Groot beer is commonly understood to be beer that is produced without hops. It's more to it than that. Um, Groot was a particular product provided by regional governments in all these places, um, subject to something called the Groot trend. And what that was is this is the first way that governments ever taxed beer, basically, in Europe. Um, and so what it was is it was a combination of herbs, spices, other sort of preservatives um, that would help shelf stabilize the beer, um, and hops directly threatened that. So, well, I realized that I've started to run over time. So we're gonna quickly wrap this up. Grutrecht is, or hops were a direct taxational threat to the Grutrecht. Um, the Grutrecht was a system and series of laws of an arbitrarily decided, well, not arbitrarily, but a very specifically designed group of herbs, and only the government would produce them, and they'd have to go around and sell them to all the breweries. And it was kept a secret because otherwise the brewers would just pull Wesley Snipes and not pay for any of the stuff. Um, yeah. So hops were really, 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 really um, just kind of cast aside. They were considered a vile and a pernicious weed by the British because they directly challenged this revenue that so many, so many places um, depended on. And actually, really, that's the main point I wanted to get across, is the Gruet and hop sort of debacle. And next time, whenever I do this, because like, I've got, I've got tons of this information you guys know. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, I'm happy to continue this, we'll talk more about innovations um, and how commercial breweries came to be. We haven't even started to talk about commercial breweries. <laughs>